Hello and welcome to Nerds at Churches live Q&A for September 2022. I'm Pastor Emily and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay and my pronouns are she, her. And we will be recording this today and then we'll post it hopefully in the next week or two on our Patreon for our Who, Which, and What's It subscribers. Um, just so you know, the only videos that are going to be recorded are Kay and I, though if you ask a question, your voice will be recorded. So if you want to ask a question, feel free to ask the question in the chat, and then we will read it out loud and share it. Um, and we've got some pre-submitted questions to get through. So we have plenty of time and plenty of questions for you. Absolutely. So our first question today is from one of our Patreon members. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, this question comes to us in three parts. And luckily, Emily and I both have it written down or else I would forget at least half of it without being able to read it again. Uh, so one, how often would you say you make your nerdy connection references in a sermon? And the follow up to uh, a does the amount of exposition and context required to make a reference impact that decision? And if so, what's your cutoff? Or perhaps asked a different way to be, uh, do you make a passing reference with one paragraph or are you jumping in and building a whole sermon around a pop culture image, etc.? That is a great question. I actually just referenced Dolly Parton <laughs> on Sunday in worship um, and talked about her as an example of someone who um, who gives away so much wealth that she should be a billionaire, but isn't because she um, serves a master who is not mammon, shall we say. Sure. Um, so that was recent. I don't do it a ton. Um, I tend to use nerdy connections at, to help me think through topics and think through what I'm talking about, but um, I'm still getting, I'm also still getting to know the congregations that I'm in. And because of that, I don't have the same like knowledge of their knowledge of nerdiness. Um, and I think probably one of the congregations would not be super thrilled with lots of nerdy connections and the other would be delighted by them. So I think I'm more likely to use them in like a Bible study than in actual preaching for me. Um, but I tend to do more, pa if it's in a sermon, I tend to do more passing references. Um, but I've also never done like a sermon series. So I think if I did a sermon series, it might be different. Sure. Yeah. I, sorry. I, I would agree that I don't uh, make them in my sermons all that often. Part of that is because I've been doing rural interims for a while now, and it's kind of hard to judge which references people would get. Like, I'm willing to bet that a decent chunk of these people have seen the original Star Wars movies, but other than that, it, who knows? And uh, I also have found that the the real meat of what we do on Nerds at Church for me is less the actual references themselves and more the questions that arise from them or the point of view that they uh, unexpectedly make me take for a moment. Uh, and that can sometimes uh, give me a, a new great approach for a sermon. Uh, and about half the time that Nerds at Church directly impacts my sermon, I would say I am halfway through writing my sermon and I say to myself, oh, wait, wasn't I just thinking about this three days ago? <laughs> and, uh, and it shows up that way. So that that can be interesting. Other times uh, it's it's more obvious and something from the episode really sticks with me and I'll, I'll try to emphasize that point of view on purpose. But I literally started a new call yesterday. So I have no idea hey. what these people will get or not. Uh, so I'm still working through that, but yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, our then we have a bunch of other submitted questions. And um, one of them is, if you could have a crossover Nerds at Church slash horror Nerds at Church episode on a movie based on 
any Bible passage, what would be the horrific Bible passage you'd like to see adapted? So I have to admit, I was getting a little nerdy with this because I don't tend to, like, there are parts of the Bible that are horrific and meet that definition. I don't mm -hmm. tend to think of much of the Bible as being in the genre of horror. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, and so I, uh, I had a little trouble coming up with something, but uh, as I thought about it further, I realized that the story of Esther could absolutely become a horror movie and the goalposts mm -hmm. would kind of move through the story from the, the first horrible thought of, I'm sorry, you want me to what with this guy? Uh, to the next horrible thought of, wait, you mean they're actually going to kill all of my people? To the following concept of, so exactly what could happen to Haman if we pull this off right? <laughs> uh, and I think that could absolutely turn into a, a horror movie of some type. I don't think you could probably have any Muppets in it. Probably not. I think that's that's the tricky part. We've gotten so used to casting <laughs> in movies that the idea of you have to remember that not all movies actually have to have Muppets. As as striking a concept as that is, it is yeah. nonetheless. Although like if it's an Avenue Q, more of an Avenue Q style of Muppets, I could see I, but not with any of the Muppets we know and love. Yeah. No. They'd have to be new different Muppets. Yeah. They'd have to be the Avenue Q type of Muppet. Puppets, yeah. Um, I was thinking of Judges 19. Yeah, that's horrific. Yep. It's particularly horrific, but I think so much focus gets placed on um, Genesis 19 and the story of Sodom yeah. that nobody pays attention to Judges 19 because it's in some ways a flip um, and in some ways another of the same story. Um, and so I think that would be an interesting one because it is very horrific. There's a lot of body horror, that sort of thing. But also I think it would be a really good one for people to know about, especially if they yeah. have not typically known about it. Yeah. Uh, so our next question is, if you could make a superhero Avengers-like team out of Bible characters, who would they be and what would their superpowers be? Uh -huh. This is fun and hard. Um, obviously, Jile would have to be <laughs> on the Avengers team. Um, and I was thinking that like she could have um, the ham instead of like a hammer like Thor, it would just be a tent peg that yeah. she would have, but like similar powers and stuff. Yeah. Um, also, I was thinking Mary Magdalene and she could have a voice that like thunders and deafens and destroys and that builds and creates and nurtures. So she gets like both of those because she was the first preacher of the gospel. Sure, absolutely. And like maybe also she could just have a normal voice that doesn't do anything. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the like the superpower of her. Having voice, to choose between also, one or the other of those all the time and then not being able to talk otherwise would be kind of a lot. That um, would be awful. I, I am not about silencing any right. women, especially Mary Magdalene. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I admit when I first heard this question or when I first read this question, my first thought was Elijah in the flaming chariot. Like, I don't know that he would have <laughs> extra powers. I'm cool with that if he wants to, I guess, but like it, dude with a flaming chariot. Okay, sure. That sounds great. Uh, and then I was uh, immediately from there drawn to Elisha and the story of the bears and the children, which is not exactly... <laughs> the kind of power that you would hope for, I guess, but also like, I suppose, I really love stories that involve a very, very specific superpower with very solid lines and boundaries and the concept of someone who can have a certain amount of power over bears and tell them what to do, but only if someone has just been insulted kind of fascinates me. <laughs> yeah, and does it have to be if you were insulted or can it be if other people were or like what if you just heard about it and you weren't actually there I don't know but I, sounds that like sounded like an interesting option it sounds like you're making Alicia a D&D &D character and I'm here for it possibly sure. I would love to DM also like if your mentor has a 
gigantic flying flaming chariot, I think that you're naturally going to wind up having a less awesome power than he does. <laughs> and so like, let's, let's just let Elisha live into that. Um, and, uh, but also the, like, the power over bears might actually be, might be less impressive, but probably more effective. Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Like, uh, the problem with the flying flaming chariot, you really can't hide that. There's no stealth there. <laughs> Everybody and their brother is going to be able to see you, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose, you know, it. I would feel weird if we didn't bring up Jesus somehow. So uh, Jesus can obviously turn water into wine and apparently can also turn wine into blood. And that makes me wonder what Jesus can do between water and blood. And that's... Ooh. So that like, seems like a little a Egyptian bender? plague style. I I don't know, but either um, that or Jesus is a waterbender. I ooh okay, Jesus is a waterbender. I like better. That's that's a little less yucky than what I was trying to think through. Um, but also, like I realized that I'm doing a bunch of dudes here, so I am totally up for Deborah having a magic gavel along the lines of M Mjolnir or something <laughs> like that. And uh, it should, I, I mean, you know, Deborah is 100% allowed to smack people upside the back of the head when they're being foolish. And uh, if she had a gavel to do that, I think that would be cool. I suppose it could have magic powers. That's fine. I don't really think Deborah needs magic powers, but <laughs> uh, sure. Um, oh, also, I thought I was thinking of Lydia, the cloth sure. maker, which makes purple cloth. Um, so, but it could be that the, like, purple cloth is like a shield. She makes shields out of purple cloth, kind of like Black Panther style. Sure. Um, or they could be invisibility cloaks, or they could be like Doctor Strange, and they, like, fly people around. Local I don't levitation. know. I'm open to all of those. Yes, my personal favorite is the concept that the cloak of levitation uh, actually has, you know, opinions about people and makes that clear. Um, I uh, still so. think that, I think I said this in our Horror Nerds at Church um, episode on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness that came out at the beginning of this of our current season of, of Horror Nerds at Church, but I would like to see a movie where the star of the movie is the cloak of levitation. I'm up for that, sure, absolutely. I think that'd be great, but yeah. that'd be my preference. There was a movie, oh, I don't remember what it's called now. Alan Rickman did a movie with Hugh Grant uh, where they, it, it's based sort of on them both being actors known for playing Peter Pan, or well, Alan Rickman is known for playing uh, Hook rather in a production of Peter Pan. And for the first half hour of the movie, Alan Rickman doesn't say a word. And it's, a, the ending is like bizarre and creepy and wrong of, of the movie. But the first half hour of the movie is fascinating because Alan Rickman totally doesn't need to talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it, it was, yeah, really interesting. Huh. Now I'm really curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, watched the first half hour, skipped the rest of the movie. It, you'll, you'll thank me. It, it got, it went some really creepy places. Well, I don't know the title of it, so I probably yeah, you'll probably be fine. Yeah, um, and then number our number next, our next <laughs> question is yes, who would win in a celebrity brawl, Gandalf or Dumbledore, and why? <laughs> so I actually have two possible answers to this, and the first one I'm going to admit right off is kind of mean. Gandalf would mean because Dumbledore, Ga Gandalf would win because Dumbledore is dead. <laughs> I don't really know how else to put that, but you know, yeah. Dumbledore's dead. Sorry. Hard to win a fight when you're dead. Yeah. If, if you show up to a magic fight when you're dead, I think you're going to lose. Uh, that's how that works. I mean, unless it takes place in King's Cross. I suppose. I don't really see Gandalf wandering off to train stations. That doesn't that's seem true. like his style. I do. Yeah. And so my second thought after I said, okay, that does seem a little mean, uh, would be uh, Gandalf again would win. Uh, but this time, because like Gandalf is the kind of person who he made friends with the eagles who then showed up to rescue him from Saruman's tower, tower right? Mm -hmm. He himself has a lot of friends. Dumbledore has a lot of people who admire him and a uh, handful of people who like specifically owe him something, but he would have to contact somebody who could contact somebody who could contact somebody to come rescue him. 
and that takes a while. And I think he might, you know, not, that wouldn't go well for him. So. That might, yeah. I was thinking Dumbledore would beat Gandalf because Gandalf is too decent. And Dumbledore would go for blood if he could get the right justification because he literally like raised a baby to kill him. So wouldn't put anything past Dumbledore in terms of like tactics. I mean, I'm not putting that past Dumbledore by any means, but also like Gandalf fought in multiple actual wars. I, I don't think he would have a problem with the concept of a duel. Yeah, but I just I just think Gandalf okay. is too good to like. Sure. I don't know. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, so taking a slightly different uh, uh, point of view for this one, uh, what is your favorite psalm? My favorite psalm is Psalm 139. Um, not a huge fan of the ending, though it's nice to have like the prayers for vengeance given. I mean, voice. you might need those, sure. Yeah, um, I like that they're prayers and not God's answer. Yeah, that's true. But I love, I love the idea of God being with us through our whole lives. And um, the there are some people that like use this as a like anti-trans kind of passage but um i love it and i love it specifically when the question is also posed at what point right if we are made in god's image and this is part of like how god creates us at what point is god finished creating us is it when we take our first breath is it when we turn 13 is it when we're baptized and then the answer very easily becomes God doesn't. And so then we get to be co-creators with God. Yeah. Our own who we are and how we bear God's image. Yeah. Um, I love the lore of Psalm 46. Uh, many Lutherans will know this as the Psalm that Martin Luther used to write Mighty Fortress. Uh, a Mighty Fortress is our God, uh, our beloved hymn. Uh, so Psalm 46 uh, does this interesting thing that I like to teach my confirmation students about, which is that uh, in the King James Version of the Bible, if you count 46 words down from the beginning of Psalm 46, you find the word shake. And if you count 46 words backwards from the end of Psalm 46, you find the word spear. And guess who was 46 years old the year that the King James Version of the Bible was published? Shakespeare. There is a ancient theory, uh, fairly ancient, that, uh, that King James wanted to include a nod to Shakespeare uh, in the King James Bible for whatever reason, and that is how they chose to do it, because it, uh, you know, approximately worked for the translation and all. I, it's probably a load of bunk, but also, like, it is a great example of those bizarre, twisty, turny theories that people come up with about the Bible that, like, try to turn it into, uh, uh, you know, magic numerology or stuff like that. And it is exactly the kind of thing that people love to pull with the Bible. And so I like to tell my confirmation students this so that they can laugh at it and realize that they don't actually always have to take stuff like that seriously. <laughs> I appreciate that, particularly given other questions that are coming up about yeah. pop culture and the Bible. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. If you were Martin Luther level bossy when it comes to the Bible, what books would you want to include in the appendices as he famously moved um, the epistle to James and Revelation into the appendix? Yeah, um, I, I feel like I have a superstitious need to mention that I really tried not to tell God what to do here, but <laughs> Uh, I also, uh, I kind of agree with Martin Luther on those concepts. I, it's not that I would want Revelation to be in an appendix. It's that I would want there to be like a gigantic intro that you have to read before you're allowed to read it. <laughs> um, and cause you, you need some context for that book. Let's be honest. Um, and James, 
there are bits that do kind of need a bit of an asterisk uh, in a similar way, uh, but I'm, I'm fonder of James overall uh, in terms of how it's been accepted by the, the general public. Uh, excuse me. Uh, mostly that's because the Book of Revelation has been so thoroughly twisted and, and screwed over by the general public. Um, and uh, I, there are whole chunks of the pastoral epistles I could just toss that that would be fine, sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I like James, so I am here for James being part of the Bible. Sure. Um, but but yeah, some of the pastoral epistles that are like attributed to Paul but are not Pauline, which you can check out um, more about what Paul actually wrote and said in our episode uh, from this past Easter season on Paul. Um, yeah, it was our, I believe our Easter one, not Easter one, our third Sunday of Easter episode, which we'll link to um, for those who are watching this after the fact. Um, but yeah, I am not a fan of the Timothys, which we are currently getting um, this fall. They, I just, I don't need First Timothy. I don't need Second Timothy. There are occasionally a couple good lines, but like, those types of lines also exist elsewhere. Yeah. So yeah. most of this week's is not bad, but also we get that elsewhere. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what is your favorite snack while podcasting? <laughs> uh, my favorite snack is, well, okay, first question. Coffee, I'm assuming, doesn't count as a snack. It's We're just Lutherans, coffee is a sacrament. It's just a necessary part, a necessary part of podcasting, um, as is water. So my favorite snack is actually fruit snacks, but I have to open them before we start recording because the fruit snacks pass it, packages are super noisy, but as long as I can just like sneak a fruit snack <laughs> or, a, or Skittles, Skittles are also really good because they're small enough that like I don't eat them and then can't talk there's no chewing yeah the, the lack of chewing is really the important part there yeah my microphone does not let me get away with snacks during podcasting uh i it is too sensitive and uh so i have occasionally been known to just have a random spoonful of peanut butter before we start because the protein is helpful uh, but uh otherwise uh, i i drink a ton and a half of flavored water because i'm on a medication that gives me dry mouth and so i usually have water with me while recording i have to be very careful about my coffee intake so i'm not usually drinking coffee during it uh and also there are there are some liquids that like irritate my throat sometimes and i don't want to do that during podcasting so yeah that makes sense i definitely need coffee like the times that we've podcasted before I had coffee yeah no one of these days we really need to work out an IV for you that's that's a necessary thing <laughs> it's true it's true coffee indeed mm -hmm. um, okay our next question is if you ever move on from the three-year lectionary cycle which is what we've also called the revised common lectionary would yes. y'all do narrative lectionary themed podcasts, going through a book of the Bible, like Bible study style, something else? Yeah, so I've actually brought this up with Emily uh, previously in a planning conversation, and uh, we've thrown around the idea. We have like a year left on the Revised Common Lectionary, and we've also done a decent chunk of the Revised Common Lectionary in our previous podcast incarnation. So I think we're both kind of like not that interested in necessarily keeping going on the RCL forever. Uh, I, I don't think we have to do that. Uh, but uh, I do believe that if we did either some kind of like themed scripture choices or going through a book over the course of a few episodes. Uh, either way, I think that would probably open our audience up a bit because like there are a ton of people out there who have no idea what the RCL is, even if they attend a church that uses the RCL. And like explaining that to people takes 20 minutes and they don't care. So 
I, I think that would widen our audience considerably. And also, handily, we will have had plenty of experience in this by then. <laughs> and that will probably help. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know exactly how that would work. I, I would like to keep at least the structure of each time we look at a particular passage of scripture. Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I love our sibling podcast, uh, Horror Nerds at Church, um, but I, I like the structure of looking directly at scripture and then going from there instead of starting with another starting place and going into scripture. It, this just works better for me, how my brain works. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would probably not ever do narrative lectionary because here's the shade i think it's really not great um which is putting it mildly because i don't know how to make people r2d2 so <laughs> <laughs> um yes. i i just don't like the fact that you have to spend a whole year stuck in john <laughs> but that's just me. yeah i it it was created by luther seminary which is a queer phobic seminary and yeah. So I, in general, am not like a huge fan of them, but also it's such a niche group and it's just like the, the choices about who, 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 yeah, yes. I just don't need to. Um, so I would probably not do a narrative lectionary. I also like the idea of doing, of starting with scripture um, as a co-host of both podcasts. Yes. I like that Horror Nerds at Church starts with usually a movie or a TV right. show and jumps off from there. And I like that we start with the Bible and jump in from there. Um, so I like that sort of a thing and doing like a Bible study through books or something like that. Um, I also like that we have guests, which is something that is yes. new to nerds at church that was not part of our previous iteration, HP at church. Um, and, but I don't know like what all it, would look like it also would give us space <laughs> to gasp have seasons <laughs> breaks yes that that would be lovely amazing um yeah. we could you know take vacations without planning six months in advance when we're going to record the episode <laughs> and also edit the episode yeah so yeah that would be i think that that would be a really good idea and i would be totally open to it. But as Kay said, we have one more year of this lectionary as nerds at church. Um, so I'm not really thinking about that hard um, at this point because yeah. it's not even the advent yet. Right. So what gave you the idea for this podcast? Um, the idea for this podcast for me came from listening to two podcasts. Um, this was when I was like part-time rural ministry, uh, pretty isolated. So I would like can tomatoes and listen to podcasts a lot. Yeah. Um, so I was listening, the, the first two podcasts I ever really listened to were Harry Potter and the Sacred Text and Witch Please, a feminist critical reading of the Harry Potter books, movies, and all things of the sort. Um, and so those were just like podcasts that like were interesting to me. And then Witch Please did a special show one time where they recorded themselves on a panel at um, a conference and they talked about being a podcast and how they got into it. And then also the importance of people who are not cishet white guys to have podcasts and be on <laughs> and I was like I am in fact not a cishet white guy I'm glad you figured that out Emily <laughs> yeah me too um but it was just this like oh I could do this I do have this idea um at the time I was still very much a hardcore Harry Potter fan and so that's where like that came from um but yeah that was kind of the the crux of like, oh, I could do this. And I want to do this thing that connects Harry Potter and scripture. Yeah. 
Yeah, as for me, uh, Emily put a post in a clergy group and I said, yes, please. Uh, I was doing rural ministry as well. And uh, my husband is delightfully nerdy, although we have slightly different interests uh, of nerdiness. Uh, and the idea of being able to talk to, about nerdiness with, you know, the entire universe or possibly just a handful of people seemed like a great plan. Uh, and uh, I was eventually talked into being willing to try sound edit, which... Which We've all seen the growth uh, that I've gone through with that process. So, also true, but also yeah. okay, you do a wonderful job, way better than I could. I, it's it's quite the learning curve. Yeah, yeah. but you know, someday if all of our Patreon listeners um, get all of their friends to also be Patreon subscribers, yes. then we'll have enough money to pay someone to do it, and then. And we'll real fancy sound not action. only would i be delighted about that but also that would give us both a lot more time to like plan this stuff in advance mm -hmm. and find in more interesting guests and yeah it would be great so yeah so that's our plug patreon supporters yeah. go patreon go help us find more patreon people and we'll do more stuff like this Evangelism seems like the wrong word. Please shill for us. <laughs> yes, please. Um, our next question is, what is one thing that pop culture slash pop Christianity slash parishioners always get wrong about the Bible that you would like to clarify? Uh, well, I am possibly hanging a little heavier on the parishioners aspect of this question than strictly necessary, uh, but I would definitely say uh, hell. Uh, hell is way more complicated than most people think. Uh, Dante is not part of the biblical canon and not meant to be, uh, and usually the Bible is actually talking about something else when you think that it's talking about hell or damnation. Uh, and uh, that also goes for Jesus, particularly. Uh, there are a couple of times when the Bible is like legit talking about a concept that is not completely dissimilar to our modern conception of hell, but like really mm, not nearly as often as you think. And it seems like I've been having that conversation a lot the last couple of years. So, Yeah, hell is definitely one of those. All of the like will be thrown out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and Gehenna. like yeah listen i there's weeping and gnashing of teeth like in my house when i have to do the dishes okay it's <laughs> it's not that bad yep. it'll be fine Gehenna is literally just the dump right outside of town like, yeah like it's on fire and it probably smells terrible but still yeah um i the other one i would say and this goes back to your answer about uh, if you were to Martin Luther, the Bible, um, revelation, the end times, the end times are not what most people think, because most people think they are the left behind series and the left behind series is not biblical. It is a million percent really weird fan fiction. If I could go um, back in time and arrange for the unpublishment of a book series. That would be the one. Yeah, for very sure. Very possibly. Yeah. I, uh, okay, yes, I, there are probably other candidates now that I think about it, but still. There are, but like for book series, that one's a pretty high up there. For, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Revelation is not about what you think it's about. Just had this conversation with somebody. Um, and also, if you want to know more about what Revelation is about, you can check out our episode from the second Sunday of Easter this year, where we did a deep dive into Revelation and talked all about it. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, what deep dive topics, speaking of which, uh, do you really want to do, but you haven't done or found a spot for yet? Time. <laughs> I want to do a deep dive into time. A, there's a million nerdy things. I actually just listened to the Witch Please podcast on time travel for okay. their, like reboot in the third in the third book they talk about time travel and theories around that um so that would definitely be one and there's like there's just so much 
nerdery about it, right? Like we would finally get to talk about Doctor Who a whole bunch. What would be super awesome is to get like the folks from Tarbis, Time and Relative Blackness in Space, who would be guests on our podcast. The folks from Black Girls Create would be, that would be like a dream, a dream guest. Um, But yeah, I love talking about time and I love talking about the difference in the Greek Kronos and Kairos. And I wrote a paper on it in seminary. I just want to talk about that wibbly wobbly, timey wimey ball of stuff. You know, come to think of it, it's a good thing you brought this up after I moved because now that I finally have access to my library again, I used to have a book about like different theories of time travel, but I don't remember if I got rid of it or not. So I might still have that. I'll, I'll have to see if I can find it. Uh, personally speaking, uh, I think the last deep dive we did that I was like super excited about because I got to pick what the, uh, it was sort of my impetus uh, encouraging us to do it was the Middle East geography one, which I suppose might sound a little weird, but uh, I, I really like doing like practical stuff that a lot of people don't bother thinking about that aspect of things when it comes to the Bible and yet knowing just the basics can make so much of the Bible come alive and uh, and be so much more realistic for you uh, just even knowing the, the very basic simple parts of the geography the general gist of it um, and uh, I also admit that uh, certainly, uh, there are plenty of philosophical topics as a philosophy major that I would be perfectly happy to jump into. Um, I, there are just a couple of topics that I would really love to avoid uh, because I have done those to death, like the problem of evil or uh, the concept of like, can you prove there's a God? The answer is no, by the way, that's kind of the point. But uh, <laughs> I've just had those conversations too many times to enjoy them at this point, frankly. Um, but I will say, I imagine at some point we are going to have to do a deep dive into evil but yeah no and i'm yeah uh, other options yeah well and and talking about like what actually is evil is more interesting to me than talking about the pro how how dare god allow evil to exist which is just not interesting to me anymore Although i think <laughs> if we did do i mean we, evil might come up in the next like in the revised common lecture i think but i mean we talk about evil already quite a bit <laughs> It's true. It's true. But if we did a deep dive in evil, I feel like that would be like a Job Bible study. Like when we get it, if we got into like Bible study series and did Job and evil and suffering, and we could even have like a Buddhist come on and talk about suffering. And and that's interesting because I'm not entirely sure I would class what happens to Job as evil. Suffering, yes. But anyway. Whole separate deep dive, we'll get there probably eventually. Um, and uh, I also, uh, one of these days, it would take a ton of research, but I would be super interested in doing a deep dive on etiquette, specifically comparing the ancient biblical world etiquette to our modern day, like in person etiquette, to the complete crap show that is online etiquette and how that is interpreted so differently by different people. Um, and uh, and the general rules of, you know, how you know what the right thing to do is. So I find that really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I also, that would be fascinating. I would not be interested in doing that research. So I'm glad that you're like down for the research. I have no idea where to go for like half of it, but uh, I, I'd be interested in figuring that out. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. I, I also like, this is just a like side note plug. Thing, but I have loved the diversity of deep dives we've had this year. Yeah, so yeah, it's been really good. From like the practical of Middle East geography and um, and like Revelation and Paul. Yeah. And we've also had like barns. <laughs> deep dive into barns yes. that actually ended up being really great. We and pose. And, and pose and yeah, yeah, lots of other yeah. done, like and gay baking and like so many <laughs> things yeah you know when we started doing deep dives i was a little concerned that we would come up with like a dozen topics and then not be able to think of anything else but happily that seems to have not happened yeah so. and as is evidence for our <laughs> patreon supporters in particular this week where we actually picked a deep dive that was 
a little bit too big. A little much, in fact, possibly. Too big, guys. Maybe we should have done one of those. Yeah. And so now we have a Patreon episode that's an uncut episode with just us. We we are very good at tangents. It is a gift. I suppose one day we should probably do a deep dive on geometry because we're so good at tangents. <gasps> you totally should. <laughs> I will let Emily do the calculating of exactly how tangential we get during that deep dive. So. I love it. Tangents on tangents on tangents. Oh my gosh. A deep dive into math. We have to yeah. keep track of these. Um, but also curious what our Patreon subscribers are interested in for deep dives. Um, I know we've had uh, at least one vote for theodicy, which is like yes. a whole problem of evil and things. Yeah, I can do that conversation. It's just, I've had some of that conversation so many times that I will just not respond with joy to it, but I can do it. <laughs> yeah, in my yeah. sleep at this point. Yeah. Um, and also, I think I saw a vote for Westworld, a deep dive into Westworld, and or that Westworld be, would be a good connector for suffering, which is true. Sure. I need to get a little bit further into that show, probably, or it might be, it might be. I mean, I could definitely come up with some questions about like AI and ethics and, uh, Oh man, that would probably take us into uh, philosophy of consciousness, which at one point made me want to stab myself in the eye with something sharp, but th that was college. I've, I've matured since then. So I'm sure we'd be fine. I am glad. I'm glad. Um, yeah. Um, so then we have, we also have a question in the chat. Um, since there is an upcoming Nerds at Church or Nerds at Church crossover, which by the way, which, which, <laughs> which, by the way, is, um, I believe we need, I believe, I don't know if we've announced it officially on which channels. I have not kept the best track, but we do have an upcoming, okay, we have an upcoming for Nerds at Church, Nerds at Church crossover episode for Hocus Pocus 2. Yes, we know Bette Midler is a turf. We're going to talk about it. I promise. Um, so that's coming up. Keep your ears open for it because we're a podcast. Um, yes. Also, we'll be putting up on our Patreon a movie commentary for the first Hocus Pocus that we're going to do together, as well as a teaser. You can also check out our Hocus Pocus episode from last year when we were on Horror Nerds at Church to talk about that. But shameless plugs aside if you could recast hocus pocus with muppets since one of the humans is a turf which muppet would you be would be which which in other words which which is which <laughs> i love puns now we have a name for a new patreon tier i think um <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so who mm -hmm. are we casting? Uh, for the record, this is the first question we haven't had like previous time to think about, so. It's true. <laughs> it's true. I think. Well, I think we're definitely going to have to do some gender bending because there are a limited number of female moments. I mean, Miss Piggy. Is going to have to be one of them, but I'm. I well okay she'd definitely be Winifred. She's the leader. Yeah. Right. That's when well, Winifred is the oldest sister that played by Bette Midler. Yes. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. and yeah she she would definitely be running the show. Um and after that let's see. Uh Mary is the one who likes to cook, specifically who likes to cook children and and the Swedish chef likes to cook chickens so Camilla is obviously one of the kids and yes. the Swedish Camilla chef. can play Emily in the Muppet version <laughs> there we go Camilla as Emily um <coughs> uh and this the Swedish <gasps> chef okay okay a human as the cat a human playing Thackeray Binks I love that yes and of course they'd have to be black 
Like there's no other option, right? Um, a human cat. Hmm. It'd be like they, they could have a, a little like headband with cat ears on it. Yeah, it'd be like it cat, would be very cute. But the not creepy version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the first version from the '70s, not the later version with the CGI that didn't need to ever happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and. I, I could see the Swedish chef as Emily as uh, as Mary. Um, Mary does actually have a few lines, and the Swedish chef is not exactly what we'd call like erudite, but uh, that's an option. And then mm. the third one. Actually, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a an alternate ver option for Mary, which is Doctor Honeydew, mm. because Doctor Honeydew a can talk and b. Uh, is you know sort of experimental like Mary. Mary seems to like trying different things with the the recipes that she's doing, uh, and so I could I could see that, just over a cauldron instead of a beaker. <laughs> okay, okay. But well, what about the third? What's the third witch? Uh, uh, actually, I think her character's name is Sarah, isn't it? Um, and uh, played by. Uh, yeah, Sarah. I can see her face. Mm -hmm. um her yeah from uh sarah jessica parker there we go uh from sex in the city not sarah michelle geller from buffy that's the awkward conversation my brain was having that's and i get them confused all the time okay, okay. Thank you. yeah um hmm i think my first guess is to say janice because of the long blonde hair but really janice does not have that personality at all janice is not about luring people um janice would not want to yeah do that um that's a good question okay i have to google my bits real quick <laughs> hmm because i don't think gonzo i mean gonzo kind of but gonzo is a good go-to for us i think I, not, yeah, I'm not really saying Gonzo. I'm trying to think of someone who would like want to, you, you could see them at the head of a line luring people off to, you know, what do something. And uh, honestly, I think Dr. Teeth is the person coming up to, uh, coming to mind for that. Uh, because uh, I, like, I don't think he'd want to eat children, but I could totally see him like starting a conga line. And that I think might be as close as we get. <laughs> Luring them off with the Congo line. Sure, sure, I could, okay. I could see that. Okay. The problem is that the the Muppets are all so like, not all of them are are necessarily sweet and and perfect bundles of joy, but like they are generally pretty benevolent. It's true. Aside from just you know having a really impressive love of knives, as one might occasionally do, uh, like the Swedish Chef, but. Um, So our last question that we have prepared that neither of us is excited for <laughs> put it at the very end Boo. is who is your least favorite Muppet? Which is very sad because we have yeah. a love of Muppets, hence. Which is why we started doing this in the first place. Yeah. And also like, most of the Muppets, so many of the Muppets start as children. And so like, I'm, I feel like I would be saying that there's a particular six year old who's my least favorite, which just feels like I'm suddenly having flashbacks to public school and I don't need that. <laughs> and yeah, I think that my least favorite Muppet is Sam the Eagle. There's just too much like patriotism nationalism that like it feels there's that a way. lot of like, yeah there's a lot of baggage there and stuff that i'm just like you know i'll pass like almost every time yeah. that, we, that we cast him he is in the role of somebody that i don't ever want to be in the role of right <laughs> but also like they i i kind of think that given the the times that they that they've handled when sam eagle has shown up they've done a fairly decent job of like threading that needle, I, I think, for the most part. Um, I believe they, they you. They acknowledge some of it. But still. Yeah. Um, 
And also Sam the Eagle is, you'll forgive the phrase, usually playing the straight man, which I think usually gets the best lines. <laughs> so he does get some great lines here and there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I think I have a, a moral objection to this question. Uh, um, That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, I think that is all of our yep. questions, unless, um, unless anybody has any more questions to throw in the chat or to throw your voice at, um, then a couple quick, just like heads ups announcements. Um, definitely ch check out obviously our Patreons. Um, for those of you who are our Patreon, who, which, and what's it supporters, which is all of you, um, we are getting to the point where we're ready to do the like, um, to look at a passage for you. So if you have an idea of what passage you want us to do a uh, Nerds at Church deep dive into, um, let us know that. Uh, also, make sure you check us out. We will be on Horror Nerds at Church's feed, and that episode, I believe, comes out October 20th is when it's scheduled to come out. But you can look at our Hocus Pocus episode from last year, which we'll link in the episode descriptions at any point. And um, we'll put on our Patreon for both uh, both Horror Nerds at Church and Nerds at Church. We'll put our movie commentary on that. Also, we have a new... Um, a new and delightful merch, uh, some new and delightful merch options for sure. We have a Halloween-ish one. Horror Nerds at Church is, I think, going to come up with some Halloween-ish ones, but they've still got a little bit of time. Um, also, let's be honest, most of their merch is a little Halloween-ish. So. It's true. It's true. And also, Halloween can be any time. It is, in yes. fact, true that murder is bad all the time. Absolutely, all year long. Yeah. You can celebrate the badness of, of murder whenever you like. So feel free to buy our merch, uh, check out the merch store at bit.ly slash nerds at church merch. And we will link to that in our episode description for this episode as well. Um, I don't think we have anything else. We just have some awesome, some more awesome episodes and guests coming up so make sure you keep checking it out and keep telling your friends absolutely and, and we appreciate you that's why we spend an hour quarterly doing this All yes right, so thank we'll, you yeah we'll let you know when our next live q a it comes up it's technically scheduled for december probably we'll push it to january um, yeah, December is not a good time of year for us. <laughs> we know what December is for yeah. basically our entire listener base and us. Um, so probably we'll do it more in January, but um, I guess in the meantime, that means also check out the advent calendar that Faith Collective is coming out. Um, I'm part of creating it, and so is Pace, the co-host for Horror Nerds at Church. So I'm excited about it. We did it last year really impromptu and this year we're gonna plan things <gasps> it's amazing we're very impressed thank you <laughs> all right um that's it for us make sure you keep drinking your water and send us more questions you can put them as replies to this link that we have in the patreon if you want and we will save them for our next live q a we love our patron supporters. Thank you. Indeed. As the ancient Christian said, Pax Phobiscum. Phobiscum.